Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Open for me the gates of righteousness, and I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. And this is the gate of the Lord, through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me, and you have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. So let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And from the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God. And he has made his light shine on us. So with bows in hand, let us join in the festival procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. So give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Amen. I know you just sat down, but please stand for the reading of the gospel. As we honor the king. Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Beit Phage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the Say to the daughter of Zion, He, your king, comes to you gentle and riding on the donkey and on the colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the tree and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in the Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let's pray. <clears throat> so, Father in heaven, uh, many, us, many of us hear this story year after year. But we pray that this year there will be something different and that uh, you will speak to us as we sit here in Jerusalem with palm branches and that uh, clearly we will hear your voice 
and we will be directed and guided by you and be able to walk in the way of repentance and, and the way of your Son, Jesus the Messiah. Amen. Amen. So, I um, was recently listening to a podcast or a lecture on YouTube by a very um, noted Jewish Bible scholar. And um, this man gave an amazing lecture, and he talked about um, what separates Jews and Christians. And um, very often the issue, especially here in Jerusalem, and uh, between Jews and Christians and even uh, with Jews, with Christians and Muslims, is the divinity of Jesus or the Trinity. And amazingly, this man said, <clears throat> no, actually, the Hebrew Bible, and he is a Orthodox Jewish Bible scholar, the Hebrew Bible will allow such a thing, a Trinity, a divine Messiah. He said, our disagreement with, G with Christianity he said, it's really simple, yes. Can a crucified man be the Messiah? And uh, that was the issue in the first century, yes. as the issue, uh, and it's certainly an issue that remains with us today. And we're talking about the, the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. But of course, that can't be separated from the cross. Yes, which is a stumbling block for Jewish people and probably for Muslims as well. And it's foolishness, yes, to the Gentiles. And um, we want to just ask ourselves a question. How does this event speak, yes, to Jews and Gentiles? But more importantly, how does the event speak to us, the church? Because I think every gospel passage <clears throat> uh, should be uh, automatically read with two questions, two basic questions. There can be more. But when we come to a story about Jesus or a saying of Jesus, uh, first and foremost, the question should pop into our mind, what does this tell me about the Lord himself? What does this tell me about Jesus? And secondly, what, how is this instructing me in discipleship? What is this saying to me as a follower of Jesus? Yes. What am I to imitate? What am I to participate in? Right? Those two basic questions are um, certainly fundamental. And make it even more interesting we're talking about an event that's happening just before Passover, and we're actually talking about two processions, two entries into Jerusalem. And I like this imagery because of the geography of Christchurch, because from the west came Pontius Pilate, and he came with his um, legions or his soldiers, he came with his, I think someone's, it's the alarm, it's time to get up. <laughs> Sleeper awake. <clears throat> <laughs> Sleepers, the hour is here. <laughs> Whew, some comic relief in the midst of a serious subject here. From the west, from uh, Caesarea Maritima, as comes uh, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of the southern part of this country in Jerusalem. And the, the Roman governor, the Roman governor comes at Passover, probably on his chariot or on his horse, uh, again, with the standards of the legion, uh, perhaps dressed in purple. Yes, with all the imperial trappings and uh, he, together with his entourage, march into Jerusalem, and they stationed themselves pretty much on this property. 
on what was uh, Herod's palace at one time and becomes the place where yearly the Roman governor at Passover comes right to Jerusalem because Passover of, for the Romans um, is the most dangerous time of the year. In a sense, it is the Independence Day, Israel's Independence Day, or the Independence Day of ancient Israel, because it celebrates slavery to freedom. It celebrates redemption. And of course, the popular common assumption was very simply that when the Messiah comes, the Messiah will come at Passover. So we should expect Messianic redemption. And that tradition, by the way, continues down to our day because at a Passover meal, an empty chair is always left for who? Elijah. And Elijah precedes who? The Messiah, right? Elijah is the messenger that's going to. And so that um, thinking and perhaps ideology, you might say, that comes from the scripture itself is still with us at this time. So this becomes a very dangerous, you might say, volatile time of the year. And uh, it's not surprising that the revolt in the year 66, of course, broke out, uh, broke out at Passover. And from the east comes another procession. Yes, um, there are no chariots. There are no horses. There are no, you know, cohorts of Roman legions or Roman soldiers, imperial banners, purple. Instead comes a prophet from Galilee riding down from the Mount of Olives and entering Jerusalem, yes, to um, the praises of, um, of the pilgrims who are coming with him. And uh, they are putting palm branches and garments in front of him. And they are um, hailing him as the King Messiah. Yeah, a very unlikely king who comes in on a donkey to the praise of children, as opposed, yes, to the pomp and the glory and the military might of Rome. And you know, the question we can always ask ourselves, which procession are we, which, which procession do we, are we in? Yes, are we coming from the West? Yes, with what the world considers to be power, yes, and success? Or are we coming in from the East with a Messiah who comes to make peace, but does so in a way that seems counterintuitive or, counter, or counterproductive, counterproductive? And so the first place I'd like to begin and almost end is with the, with the procession that comes from the east. Because before, or as Jesus comes to Jerusalem, both Matthew and Luke, Mark and John, um, are, are not, um, don't, uh, don't mention that Jesus weeps over this city. He cries over Jerusalem. And I think that um, his weeping uh, over Jerusalem is something that we, I hope that we can take uh, into consideration this morning. Just the very fact that he is torn up, yes, over the fate of, um, over the fate of his people. But before we can understand I, Jesus, or we can maybe go a little deeper into why Jesus weeps, can we not have some sympathy, right, with the Jewish people? Because in Christian teaching and preaching, it's, it goes oftentimes like this. The Jews didn't accept Jesus. You know, they were nationalistic. They didn't understand. They wanted some kind of messianic redemption that wasn't an offer from Jesus. 
you know, and aren't they unfortunate? They didn't get it, but we get it. Okay, that's the undertone of, um, of much of our teaching and preaching and the way that we read these texts. But just for a moment, just for a moment, can we not sympathize with people who find themselves really confused? Really confused? Yes, like, what's going on here, God? Why are we suffering for doing the right thing? Why are, good, why are bad things happening to good people? By the way, if you read the Old Testament, bad things happen to bad people. There's no, um, uh, you might say, reality, maybe with the exception of Job. Yeah, why, are, why do bad things happen to those who are obedient, who put away idolatry or, or immorality, for example? Why are we suffering? Why are you not allowing us, yes, to um, see your redemption? Why do we have to put up with our land polluted with idolatry and immorality? Why can't we be the people and uh, live out the role that uh, you, um, you, you have uh, promised us or you have, you have given us? Why are we living under um, the most brutal occupation? Right? The Romans, they, they knew how to r occupy or to run an empire on a budget. They didn't use a lot. They didn't have a soldier standing on every corner. They just used sheer, you know, mafia terror. Yes, brutality. And people in the ancient world couldn't understand why do they need to be so bloodthirsty? Well, why do they need to be so brutal, right? And the way that you suppressed people or humiliated people was through the cross. It was the ultimate form of shame, yes? The ultimate glory, by the way, was the military general who, Roman military general, who especially after a victory would be given uh, honor, purple would be put upon the general, he would wear you know, a, uh, uh, some form of, of crown, he would then go into the temple of a pagan god and give thanks for his victory. And all of the society, yes, would, uh, would honor and praise this particular person. Um, so there's suffering and frustration. There's confusion. Yes. And people are desperate. And in desperation, wouldn't you cry out for someone to come and deliver you? Wouldn't you cry out for a king to come and change the political system? And if you're thinking, oh, no, I wouldn't, I'm going to tell you, oh, yes, we would. Because that's what most of us do today. As Christians in our present, uh, in the, in the present uh, context, in the, in the countries that we live Yes, we want to take a shortcut, right? Because, again, because we're no different in some ways, okay, in some ways, than Jerusalem was in the year 30 when Jesus enters, right? We call ourselves the people of God, but why are these things happening? Yes, why is there so much uh, paganism? Why is there so much violence and bloodshed? Yes. Why is there so much persecution of God's people? Yes, surely what we need is a Christian president. Yes, a Christian prime minister. That'll fix everything, okay? No, that's exactly right. And so Jesus comes to Jerusalem, yes, not only as the priest and not only as the king, Messiah, but he has a role in this instance, as a prophet. Yes, Luke 13 tells, Jesus says when he's on his way to Jerusalem, no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. And I'm not minimizing Jesus and making him only a prophet, but he was in part a prophet. Yes, and his, his coming to Jerusalem is to warn his people and to call them to repentance. And when he comes and he sees the city, he knows 
that Jerusalem isn't going to repent. And he weeps. Yes, he weeps because he, he foresees the fate of a city that is going the wrong way, going in the wrong direction, and it's doing so at some breakneck speed, and it's going to end up, as a, end up in disaster. Absolute disaster, right, for the Jewish people, yes, um, and the consequences of that are st still being felt to this day. Now, how do we describe a prophet? Yes, what is the nature of a prophet? Because we have a lot of prophets today in the, in the Christian community, or prophecy has seen a resurgence, and um, that's, I think, on the whole, a good thing. But, but a prophet, how do we define a prophet? Oh, we would say someone who can foretell the future, or someone who can foretell, or someone who can, you know, say, you know, something about uh, the situation we might find ourselves in, in at the moment. Or someone who's say, who will say, um, um, in a cliche, God is doing a new thing. Yeah, uh, you hear this two or three times a day. I'm confused and so is God, you know. He's always doing a new thing every 15 or 20 minutes. But a prophet, and this is a, a, a very famous American Jewish theologian, he defined what a prophet is for us. He said a prophet is a man who feels what God feels for any given situation. Now, you might ask the question, wait a minute, does God feel? I mean, that's the first thing, because this isn't only about Jesus, right? This is about the God of Israel, right? Who has married the Jewish people or come into a covenant with the Jewish people, right? right? Who loves the Jewish people, who's been faithful to the Jewish people, even though the Jewish people have necessarily been faithful to their God. And of course, God's love for the Jewish people is ultimately his love for the nations of the world. And so, I mean, after all, does God have a does God have passion? Yep. Does God feel? Does um, you know God get angry? Does God rejoice over His people with singing? And many people ask that question because they say, if God does these things, then surely He is not perfect, right? Surely He is not sufficient. And unfortunately, our understanding of what perfection is actually comes from machines or mathematical formulas or scientific principles. So on Saturday, I came back from Jordan. I went through the land border near Beit Shan, and uh, I got stopped at security, and they wanted to search my bags. And it turned out what triggered the machine was just a book, yeah, a book on the diaconate, a small, thin book. So I said to the guy so, who was searching the bag, so machines aren't perfect after all. And his response was, oh no, they're perfect. It's just human beings that are not perfect, right? And that's very typical, right? That's how we understand perfection, yes. But what kind of God would we have if he was totally unmovable? That if he didn't or wouldn't identify with us in our suffering, or he wouldn't identify with us, yes, in uh, our rejoicing or when things, when things go well with us, all right? What kind of God would we have if he had no, right, sensitivity or no way of identifying, right, with the, with the human, 
with the human condition. That would not be a God of love. That would certainly be a God of indifference. So yes, God has a passion and God has quote unquote feelings. Yes, and the prophet, in this case, Jesus, is expressing the way God, what God feels, right, for his city and for his, um, for his people. And by the way, in Luke's gospel, at least, Jesus continues, right, to show this compassion. Jesus, when he's carrying his cross and the weeping women of Jerusalem, um, they're weeping for him or weeping on his, uh, on, his be- on his behalf. And by the way, I know it preaches well. I know it's been the main point of a million sermons. But the same crowd that praises Jesus on Sunday is not the same crowd that says crucify him. All right. Yes, I know human beings are fickle. But uh, Jesus does nothing to cause the, ma- the vast majority of the Jewish people to reject him. And surely in Luke's gospel, yes, you have this sense of people who are weeping and beating their breasts when they see Jesus carrying the cross. And they're saying to themselves, there goes another righteous Jew. How long, how long will we continue to suffer? Yes, God, when are you going to bring deliverance? And you may uh, notice how popular the church was, the followers of Jesus, in the early, uh, in the early uh, chapters of the book of Acts, right? Those who said, crucify him, crucify him, were the same ones who said, we have no God but Caesar. So this was probably a rent a mob, yes, laid on by perhaps the temple authorities, okay? So Jesus says to those weeping women, he says, you know, if they do this to me and I'm righteous, what's going to happen to the rest of you? Or what's going to happen to the wicked? In his last breath, Jesus is teaching and he's warning. He could have said, you know, I've got it really bad here. I'm really suffering. Well, I want you to just notice, you know, what's happening to me. And the sad thing is, is that in the midst of his suffering, Jesus is, has been totally abandoned, right? All of, his, all of the boys, all of the men run away. And we all know that when we're in pain or difficulty, yes, having either companionship or people present with us is so incredibly helpful, even if they can't alleviate the suffering, right? Because we're not alone. And then when they put Jesus on the cross, it's Father, forgive them. They don't, <clears throat> they don't know what they're doing. So Jesus expresses God's love for his people and God's love for this city. And we should never separate, right, Jesus from his people or even Jesus from this, uh, from Jerusalem. So there is a love and a tenderness here. There's a compassion But at the same time, there is a severe warning. And here's the paradox and the tension. The severe warning is that your house is going to be left desolate. There is going to be destruction. And it's not some angry God up there, you know, who's going to, you know, pour out his wrath on Jerusalem. It's a God who loves people, even his own chosen people or elected people. He loves them so much that he gives them free will, right? And Jerusalem was determined, you might say, uh, to uh, ultimately go his, go his, sorry, go their own way. And what does all this have to do with us? Well, I think, I hope, two things. Now, it's not of my usual 47-point sermon but two things. One, yes, do we weep with compassion? Yes, do we weep with compassion over 
the societies in which we live. Let's say we represent these societies by cities. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is our concern for New York or is our concern for Rio de Janeiro or Perth? Yes, does it go as deep as causing us to pray or to weep? Or are we self-righteous? Like, you know, they're all sinners and this they're going to get their just desserts. Yeah, I, I told them, we told them. There's no self-righteousness here with Jesus. Yeah. Or are we just passive? Oh, and the passivity goes like this. Well, this is the end times, and we know there's nothing we can do about the evil, and we know that things are only going to get worse and worse and worse. I rem- um, this is all prophesied. I remember you going years ago going to um, a conference in England, um, a prayer conference, and some person got up. He was incredibly perceptive, and he said, I think the Lord is showing me that there's going to be huge trouble, you know, in Israel. And he read a psalm that talked about the nations around about Israel coming to attack Israel. Is it Psalm 87? I don't remember at the moment. And everyone thought this was the most brilliant, wonderful presentation. And they were just, you know, overawed by, you know, what he had to say. And ironic, not ironically, not long afterwards, the second intifada broke out. And there was huge trouble and bloodshed. After the talk, we all went and had tea. And we talked about the weather or some, and I thought, why aren't we on our knees? Why aren't we weeping before the Lord? You know, calling out, right? for the Lord to have compassion or the Lord to change his mind because humility and repentance can cause God to change his mind. We can never force God, but yes, but God can be influenced, yes, by what we do and how we live. And it was, oh yeah, this is just prophecy. Isn't that exciting? And there was no concern for the people, right, who are going to die. And we did lose, what, four to 5,000 people died in the second intifada. And there was horrible bloodshed and trauma that's still with us to this day, even though that was 20 years ago. Why didn't anyone weep over this? Why wasn't there real serious intercession? Is it that we're just so focused on our individual well-being that we've lost sight of God's right heart for the nations, God's heart for our city. I have no doubt that Jesus weeps over Sydney, and he weeps over Tel Aviv, and he weeps over London. He weeps because of, not only because of sin, but because of the lack of faith, or even the lack of faithful lack of faithfulness and so the other question is are we Jerusalem we being the church yes are we Jerusalem yes again the underlying the underlying buzz goes like this you know the Jews didn't accept Jesus So look what happened to them. But it's not the accepting, uh, the acceptance of Jesus that's important. I mean, that's important, that's the first step. What's important in all this is whether we're gonna put his teaching into practice. Because Jesus said, Jerusalem, you don't know what makes for peace. Well, what makes for peace? We'll say, okay, Jesus, you're the King Messiah, but we'll still live in corruption. Or, Jesus, you're the king, Messiah, we're going to live in immorality. Or, Jesus, you're the king, Messiah, and guess what? 
We're going to solve all our problems through the political system. We are sure F-16s, or F-35s now, can be the very, your very instrument that will accomplish your purposes in this world. Yes? It's accepting Jesus, yes, and putting his teaching into practice, right? Putting his teaching into practice, right? It's the Beatitudes, or living a life of reconciliation, or forgiving our enemies, yes? Living a life of generosity, living lives of mercy, Jesus, con- Jesus con- condemns Jerusalem or weeps over Jerusalem because especially the leadership, the religious leadership, along with the messianic extremists, take the country in a wrong way. And again, it leads to disaster. And it's not to only that the religious leadership is corrupt, right? As in many places, we in the church are corrupt because we are enamored with money or we're enamored with celebrity. Yes, or the church has become a business. But that the temple was misguided in its priorities. And so too had many unfortunate evangelicals, charismatics, and other folks in other denominations We've sort of lost our way in the last few years. And so is our house going to be left to us desolate? Do we confuse the gospel with our national identity? Yeah. Are we going to protect our religious institutions at all cost? Or are we only concerned again with my salvation, maybe the salvation of my family, and... um, you know, uh, you know, the rest of the world is going to hell, and you know that's to be expected. You know, are we Jerusalem? Now, God loves His people, Israel, and when Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, it's not the last word, because it tells us in Luke twenty-one. Yes, that there will be a time when Jerusalem is trampled down by the Gentiles and there will be a restoration. And we know also from the history of the church that God oftentimes brings us discipline. Yes, we are like when we become that salt that no longer um, does its job. We're thrown out and trampled under you know, are trampled uh, on by the feet of men, right? That God will bring us, the church, into judgment. And it'll be very embarrassing and very humiliating. But God will always renew that relationship. And he will always, always uh, bring reform. And he will always bring renewal. But um, like Jerusalem... Jesus, I think, is speaking to us and warning us, right? And the place, the place where all of this begins is repentance. And as Jesus, of course, makes his way to Jerusalem, as in Luke's gospel, in Luke 13, Jesus says, repent, repent, or we will perish. All of us will perish. But also there is, an, there is a certain understanding that should make us sober that we oftentimes will reap what we sow. Not always. God is not a God of karma. Yes. You remember when Jesus said, well, someone asked him in Luke 13, well, there was a tower in uh, lower Jerusalem. It fell down. People were... People were killed. What did they do wrong? Jesus said, nothing. That's a cr- there's a crude morality there. I did something wrong, so therefore I'm suffering. Yes? 
but everyone needs to repent. But later, when Jesus is arrested in the garden, he says, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Which means not everyone who's lived by the sword will die by the sword. But at the same time, we need to be aware, right, that God in his mercy and his love, yes, will allow us, like Jerusalem, to reap what we sow. And so I think the Holy Week is a time of examination. It's time for us to continue what we started in Lent, which was a time of repentance. It's repentance not only personally and individual, but it's on behalf of our families, our churches, our communities, yes, and that um, we should have uh, enough compassion for others to be to weep at God's or weep over right the condition of the church. Yes, we do many things well. We do many things well. This is not only a time to tear down, but it's also a time to for us to be sober and to uh, not only examine ourselves, but be willing, yes, um, to be committed, yes, to suffer, yes, on behalf of others around us. So the Palm Sunday ends with this, yes, Palm Sunday ends with, with victory. Because ultimately, God, God, in the midst of human suffering and the midst of our disobedience, God does have his way. And it says the following. After this, I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes, and they were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory, wisdom and thanks and honor, and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen.